So, Michael will introduce us to eBPF Chaos uh, for monitoring to stability. Thanks for the nice introduction. I hope you can hear me okay in the back. If not, please raise your hand or maybe come a little closer. Um, yeah, I want to dive into like eBPF, my learning story, chaos engineering, how to verify that all the fancy tools we can use for troubleshooting actually work when there's no incident. Um, yeah, and also like dive a little deep into all the things. Um, my name is Michael. I go as DNS Michi, which is DNS M-I-C-H-I on social media. Um, I also believe that everything is a DNS problem, but more on that later. Um, yeah, and I am an Austrian living in Germany for roughly 10 years and I joined GitLab three years ago, roughly. Um, yeah, today we will learn a lot. So I keep this slide open. If you want to get the slides right now, you can scan the QR code, take a photo, um, follow along because I will be sharing a lot of learning content for you to practice async. Um, and it could be a little too much. So like coming from what is eBPF, what are compilers, kernel level, uh, observability, security, chaos engineering, and many other ideas which are kind of collected over the past year. I want to inspire you to um, follow them, learn more about it, um, and also make it like more approachable because I think it's a it's a complex topic which <coughs> needs to be well understood because now everyone is telling us, hey, EBPF will be used everywhere in production uh, this year, um, and we should be like aware of what is coming um, and how we can like tackle that. But before we dive into EBPF, um, just want to give a quick like introduction maybe a definition of what observability is like from monitoring to observability um, like shifting from traditional service monitoring rather more into microservices distributed environments kubernetes cluster whatever container cluster you're using different applications um, and we collect a lot of events it's not just like checking if a service is okay with state um, but in the end we do have some questions we want to ask the system, are you okay, or is the overall health state okay? But also there is po the potential that we might gather some insights where we haven't, where we haven't had any idea, like uh, the so-called unknown unknowns. And one of the things I recently found was that there was a DNS latency in, our CIC, in my CICD pipelines, um, and this caused in the, in the background a little more, uh, significantly more cloud resources. And this is something you probably wouldn't have expected, but observability can provide you the insight for that. And it can also help you in that sense um, reduce the infrastructure costs or help with um, cost estimation planning. And probably we started with the, I would say, infamous three pillars of observability with metrics, traces, and logs. And in my opinion, we are way beyond that. We have different data types. We use profiling data. <coughs> There's error tracking in, in certain environments, uh, real user monitoring, end-to-end -end monitoring, test reports. Basically, we can treat everything as observability data somehow. And I've also seen that, I think, for the open telemetry specification, there's like net flow, uh, network data being discussed to be like also collected and treated as an observability data type. Um, for metrics, pretty standard in my opinion. Uh, Prometheus shaped the way of defining a standard for the, for the open metric specification as well. We have a great query language. Um, the product and the community is amazing in my opinion. Yeah, it would basically settled. Um, thanks to Julian for introducing me to the Prometheus community many years ago. Um, regarding the data sources, well, we can collect metrics from like the Prometheus exporter, for example, but we also have the code instrumentation, for example, sending traces or the applications themselves. And for example, collecting logs could be a sidecar um, collecting the pod logs in a Kubernetes cluster. This is something which happens on the user level, so we get access to what we can see. Um, if we want to look into more data so sources, I thought of, well, um, on the kernel level, we, are, we can go deeper. Maybe I don't want to go into the kernel code that deep, but it provides me or it provides us with the idea of tracing syscalls. We get to see more deep into network events, similar to like running TCP time somewhere, for example. And we also get to see who accesses which resources. So probably <coughs> someone with a malicious intent um, 
wants to uh, read the etc uh, password file, which they shouldn't be doing, um, or even man manip manipulating them. So in essence, I thought, well, when we go deeper, maybe we, we can solve the problem, but we want to see more. And EBPF, of EBPF came around many years ago already, and the E means extended to the previous one, but actually like there is discussion whether we call it EBPF or BPF or whatever, and it really confused me last year. And I thought of, let's just call it EBPF um, and look what it, up, what it does or what, what it aims to be for. It's like the description says on the website ebpf.io, it's for observability and also for security networking. Um, and we want to do what this is performed on the kernel level. Um, and since we are rapidly moving forward and we want to collect more data types, we want to have more insights, this doesn't really work with a stable kernel model or distribution model. Um, so there was less innovation on the kernel itself in, in PPPF. Um, and the idea, what, what came up some years ago, was to run a sandbox EBPF program to being able to, like, um, being, ru being um, executed at runtime. So I can, like, attach a small program to the kernel and then, for example, collect some metrics or some network data. And I was like, okay, this sounds reasonable. Probably I want to go a little more into that detail and then think of what could be a use case. And one of the like, use cases, and this is an example from Cilium, which is one of the products um, or projects um, using EBPF, high performance networking, load balancing, and, and scaling in that regard, so like traffic and routing and things like that. But you could also use it for tracing applications, like the, the function calls and everything else, which is going on in memory in the background. Um, and also use it for performance troubleshooting. So things you probably will see if you attach a debugger somehow um, can also be enabled that way. Um, and the other thought or the other idea behind using eBPF as a technology more is um, to have fine-grained security observability to really see, hey, this, this program is calling home or uh, creating an HTTP socket somewhere and downloads a malicious software or something like that in a container, which then is a runtime supply chain attack kind of thing um, and there are many more things like everything is contained or running in a container or maybe not um, so it's, it sounded interesting and it's probably I've seen also a lot of uh, marketing talks in that regard everything sounds awesome um, it gets a little <coughs> more complicated like getting into how to how to create an EBPF program or what is it actually is it Python, is it Node.js? I was like, ah, the kernel wants bytecode. Bytecode is the, pre uh, the, the stage before it gets um, translated into assembler or micro uh, microcode for the architecture. Um, and the idea here is that we don't want to write bytecode. I, I don't, I can read a little assembler, I would say. Um, but this needs to be generated. So there were abstraction layers being created for example, Cilium or BCC or B BPF trace, would they um, translate or did they compile um, the, uh, the bytecode, which then gets loaded into the kernel. Um, the verification itself, if like the program is okay, is not done by these compilers, but it's a just-in-time compilation from the bytecode to the machine-specific instruction set. And if there is like an error with the architecture, or with something else which doesn't work, the kernel rejects that. It's a little bit of pain doing that in CI/CD, but we, we will check that later on as well. So I learned a lot on my journey. Um, and I thought, well, how would I be like getting started? I want to see something. I want to see how EBPF could help me in my daily life as an SRE or DevOps or just me creating this talk and trying to figure out how it works. Um, and I, I kind of built my own learning strategy, read a lot of resources which I collected um, on, on a knowledge base which is linked here. And I also figured that the easiest way was just create a Linux virtual machine somewhere, use a modern kernel, which could be like a, a most recent Ubuntu 22 for example, and start with Brandon Gregg's tutorial. So he has a great blog post from 2019, but it's re pretty accurate. Um, to get started with all the tools and really um, think about what could be a use case um, and, and follow along. 
and have these like two minute success moments. Hey, I've installed this tool, I can see some metrics, now I wanna learn more about this. And the other thing is like collect all the terms you don't understand yet. So there will be lots of on the way um, to really like take a note, try to explain them, look them up and kind of learn on the go because otherwise it's like standing on a barrier and not knowing what to start. And as, as a tip, how I started, just sharing some, some ideas as a beginner, I found the BCC tool chain, which allows me to see when something is executed. For example, with xx snoop dash t, um, dash t means uh, trace. Um, and so I, I kind of started some curl calls, like simulating that I would be phoning home or calling home, and exec snoop, exec snoop showed it to me and was like, okay, this looks interesting. Um, I could use that in a certain way, um, helping me debug, seeing how things are going on, what, what is going on. Um, then I read about BPF trace and I was like, oh, okay, I'm learning. Um, it provides me with a high level tracing language, so I don't need to think about any C or assembler or whatever in the background. Um, and I can gather more insights into the operating system. Um, within the documentation, I saw um, or I found this nice picture with many, many options where I could be looking at. I tried a few of them, but then decided for myself, okay, um, maybe there are some different tools which are available. And it's also like complex to understand that like the compiler or different compiler versions need different kernel versions. And it's at some point I decided, okay, um, I know enough for now. Maybe I want to do something else. Um, and for example, with Open Snoop, which I found, okay, I can trace open calls. Sort of, when I'm opening a file or writing a file, this is something I probably can write. I, I, I still know a little bit of C code from from previous open source maintainerships. Um, so I thought, hey, let's just open a file and see how it goes. Created this file, traced it, and saw. Oh, actually, I'm not like writing the file, but um, I'm linking against the uh, LD SO cache, and I'm also using libc because certain um, functions being called. And I was like, okay, this is something. I saw it. I saw something more, and it helped me learn. Now, um, then I figured, okay, there's pieces here. <laughs> What is that? It's a new tool that's actually like a BPF compiler collection of different tools. Um, and it allowed me to run certain things which are then written um, in C or also using Python in the, in the front end. So the idea is really um, the BPF program is written in C and then you communicate on the front end and the front end just means collecting the, the events or collecting something either using a file socket or something else. Um, in order to see something, what is going on, which packets are being sent in the kernel. And so I was like, oh, okay, maybe I don't want to write so much C code, but it was really nice to also get to see something. Um, then the developer in me was like, yeah, but maybe there is like a library I could use, um, not just think about all the syscalls. And I figured, well, lib, lib BPF, provides this kind of interface. Um, I could use, use C or Rust or something else. And the most interesting part for me was there's a project called Bootstrap Demos, which provides many use cases already. So if you want to like um, trace or want to measure the network traffic or see the packets um, or different things, which you probably would normally do with TCP dump, um, this is provided in all these examples. Um, my head was a little mind blown at this point um, because it was a little too much uh, to understand but it still um, it provided me with an insight to say okay now that I've gone very deep or like the steps um, from trying the tools to development maybe there's an abstraction layer so I don't need to write C code or something else in in the background um, and I thought well um, ebukf.io provides us with some library overviews which are already there so like learning the development obviously need, need certain knowledge uh, for either go c c plus plus or rust so there are like libraries being maintained and the other thought or the other thing to like have in mind is 
define a use case, find something you want to measure, you want to monitor, um, like a program is starting or certain control groups are doing something, you want to measure the, the ingress or the egress of, of traffic in that regard, some TCP connections, network interfaces. It's very much focused on uh, TCP or connections, but probably there's also more than that. You need a compiler which then kind of creates the bytecode. It's currently, I think, LLVM and GCC sorry, in version 10. In Ubuntu it's 11, so it worked, but it was quite complex to like getting it to work. The good thing is, um, for example, the, the Cilium eBPF library is written in Go, and it provides many, many use cases. So really like attaching to a program on, on the entry, on exit, um, counting the egress packets, um, and um, measuring network traffic. So again, pretty much a complex topic, but it's much more high level, so I can describe that in Golang. Um, don't, don't need to worry about C header includes something, um, which is also a problem with memory safety. Um, and when I looked at the Rust library, I remembered um, at QCon Europe in Valencia last year, there was an eBPF day, and uh, Parker is, is a continuous profiling tool and they have been rewriting the agent, which kind of collects all the function calls and, and uh, debug symbols from C to Rust in order to like have memory safety, because in C you probably don't have that, and then it's sec faults at some point. Um, but in, in Rust, this is much more safe. Um, the great thing about Aya is they have a full book, which is free. You can just like download it or follow the tutorials. Um, and run all these examples within Rust and also like create own um, programs. Now the thing is, um, maybe I, then I was like, maybe I shouldn't be writing everything on my own. Maybe someone else already did that for me. And I thought of, well, how, is there maybe something how I can like debug or troubleshoot my production environments or my testing environments and think about, hey, what is out there? And for observability, for example, Specifically, I, I found even a Prometheus exporter from uh, Cloudflare, which uh, allows us to um, collect certain system kernel metrics. Um, was pretty interesting. The other thing I found that Open Telemetry is working on collectors, which then collect metrics also on this kind of in this kind of way, and then send it either to. Or uh, Prometheus can scrape the metrics or open telemetry can receive them and there's a lot of work going on already um, another example could be using Pixie from New Relic um, which provides a platform for Kubernetes um, observability with uh, code auto instrumentation and service maps and, and many many more things um, tried that as well works really great we will see a screenshot in a bit um, and just to give you an idea what else is out there, I've also found CoRoot, um, which has an interesting implementation for service maps using eBPF with TCP connections between the containers and ports. Um, and last but not least, I've also found in the observability space Parker for continuous profiling um, to keep an eye out. Um, and all these tools can probably help me with observability. <coughs> with regards to security, I thought, well, Cilium is probably the most well known in the Kubernetes um, environment and they recently also released Tetragon which is more focused on security observability and also runtime enforcement to prevent that someone for example edits the, the TC uh, password file. Um, on the other hand, I mean, it's not the only project which, which is in development or which is maintained by in the open source community, it's also Tracy from Aqua Security <coughs> which provides a similar focus on, on runtime security and, and, and forensics and getting even more insights in certain areas. Um, and I think probably the most mature one is Falco, um, which is a threat detection engine. And it also provides you with the possibility to, for example, trace whether containers are downloading something malicious. And our um, security team at GitLab actually did something, did use uh, Falco to scan when, for example, npm install in the package JSON downloads something magic 
um, in order to block that and that there are no supply chain attacks. So there are certain possibilities with all these nice programs already. Um, and last but not least, like thinking of, hey, I'm woken up at 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, what is going on? Maybe I want to trace something uh, with DNS or specific other things in, in a Kubernetes cluster. I found Inspector Gadget, which is a collection of eBPF tools or gadgets um, to debug or to inspect certain things on a lower level. Um, pretty interesting. Caretta, and I have no idea if it's pronounced like that. I found it yesterday or two days ago. Um, it's also a new tool for service dependency maps within Kubernetes. Didn't try it yet on my to-do list. Um, hopefully on yours as well. Last but not least, um, Bumblebee is um, solves the problem because an EBPF pro uh, program needs to be distributed and packaged somehow. And they are using OCI images for distribute for distributing the um, eBPF programs, which is also an interesting idea. So basically, many of the things I need or what SRE or DevOps teams could need um, are already there. I thought, okay, now we have many great tools. We probably know how to develop all the things. Um, we want to store them. And then it, it's like the, the typical problem and the slide is an evergreen, I would say. It's pretty old. Uh, we have like time series databases, we have lo logs, log databases or log systems, whatever. Um, we have traces, we have eBPF event databases, whatever we want to store. We probably add uh, network or NetFlow data to that. Um, yeah, and maybe right, we should create our own observability data storage. Um, at GitLab we are planning with that or we are working on that. Probably others will do the same, um, and it will be a requirement in the future, probably. Or you, you're forced to kind of maintain 10 different tools, and this could lead into like do-it-yourself fatigue at some point. Um, the other thing is like the question around retention. How long should I store the data? Do I want to troubleshoot an incident, or do I need it like for a month or for a year with that data? Is it really useful what I, that I'm storing everything, or it, does it make sense to cut it down to what is important and maybe the rest is just li live and then deleted? And also the idea of like, should I self-host it and invest into infrastructure and, and ma maintaining and storage? Or is there like probably a SaaS solution for that? Um, and last but not least, I also thought about um, cost efficiency and cap capacity planning, um, also with forecasting. So collecting a lot of observability data, how is the disk storage going up and maybe I need, need to plan for next year to maybe increase that. Um, our SRE teams at GitLab have been creating a timeline which is tool helping forecasting um, and, and it's also using, I don't know the tool, but from Facebook, a machine learning um, tool which helps in that regard. Um, yeah. Observability isn't complete without any alerts and dashboards. Um, we want to reduce the mean time to response or resolve um, because we want an alert. <coughs> an alert usually gets fired when like a threshold is violated or something else is broken, and we want to like correlate that with different other things which are going on. So it doesn't make sense to get a thousand notifications in my inbox, and I have no idea what's actually broken. Um, if the alert would be sh would have like some more metadata or some correlational grouping inside, this could help. And I think like the more we collect and the more eBPF event data, this is something I I, I don't have a term right now. Um, the more we have, the hopefully we can like s solve an incident even faster rather than 4 a.m. 5 a.m. the next notification come and. At some point you figure out it's still DNS, the problem. Um, it's a story from many years ago. Um, yeah, and dashboards are also like, it's nice to see that you that everything is okay and everything is green, but really like getting an idea what is the overall health state, only see what is actually important, reducing the mean time to respond and also having some, some idea around like forecasting and trending in there should be like a paradise dashboard. Often it's like really um, 
it needs a lot of lots of iterations and change to really find the best dashboard there is. And in order to verify all of this, I, th I thought of, well, everything is green or everything is okay on a dashboard doesn't make sense. So it, it makes sense, um, but it doesn't prove anything if the alerting is correct or the dashboards are working or even like the data collection is correct in that regard. So I thought, hey, I know about chaos engineering and probably you've heard it at some point somewhere. Um, and I wanna break things in a controlled way. I wanna define the window when something is broken or forced broken and then verify that my service level objectives match the alerts, the dashboards um, and the great thing is within the uh, CNCF ecosystem our community there is like uh, Chaos Mesh, we also have Litmus Chaos and the idea is really to have a framework for these Chaos experiments so that we can ex extend that um, and it's also, and I think the screenshot shows that you can break DNS in the Chaos Mesh as well um, which provides pretty interesting insights. Um, another Chaos framework is uh, Chaos Toolkit, for example, which also provides a CLI, so you don't need to uh, run it in the Kubernetes cluster, but can, for example, integrate it in CI/CD. Um, has an extension system, which, for example, also allows to run Pixie, um, and has an extensive guide of developing extensions. And it's like, okay, can also like create my own experiments um, in order to test certain things. Um, and chaos engineering can also be used beyond traditional chaos engineering, like injecting um, unexpected behavior, kind of security pen testing or red team uh, within observability kind of, and also hardening software like fast testing, <coughs> trying to break things in, an, in a way a developer would never expect it. Um, yeah, and I thought of maybe if we can break all these eBPF examples and the nice toolings in order to see what is going on. Um, for the golden signals, like latency, traffic errors and situation, you can just use the existing Chaos experiments to break DNS, CPU, something like that. When it comes, for example, to the uh, eBPF exporter with Prometheus, um, which um, it's probably a good idea maybe to stress the CPU, do some IO latency injections, um, add some memory stress testing, or maybe even think about like delaying certain TC requests or something like that. Um, the screenshot uh, shows Prometheus running with the exporter, so if you want to try it out, they have a pretty nice uh, Docker container live demo, which can be useful probably for everyone. The other thing I want to show you or share is like I talked about Pixie earlier, which provides auto instrumentation service maps. And one of the ideas ha I had was like, again, stress testing something, also doing network attacks. So Chaos Mesh allows you to kind of simulate a DDoS attack uh, in a Kubernetes cluster and see how everything is like going on in there. Um, and on the slides, there's also a meetup link where we actually one hour tried Pixie um, and see, like figuring out what it does. Um, with regards to Kubernetes troubleshooting, um, I've tried to run uh, the DNS tracer from Inspector Gadget. I was like, okay, this kind of makes sense um, to to break DNS and then see how it goes, or maybe even like run something um, which creates out of memory or memory leaks and see how things are going. Um, so for troubleshooting, this could be a way and verifying that it, that it actually shows something. Um, yeah, showing too many tools probably, but hopefully one of them is, is an inspiration for you to try it out. Um, code is, I don't know when it started, I think some months ago, it's currently in, in 0 0.11 release. They provide or they use eBPF for the uh, for the create for network service maps, and also can they are able, to, for example, to detect out of memory kills. So I thought, okay, let's be the attacker or the, the chaos engineer in that regard. Let's break TCP and see how it behaves, um, or for example, increase uh, the network traffic and see what, what else is going. Um, the screenshot shows when it's working. I couldn't get it to work yet but I'm hoping to in the, in the coming uh, weeks at some point and similar to like if, if, <coughs> if, you, for, if you would be using a profiling with Parker for example with using auto-instrumented um, source code the chaos could again be like 
adding some CPU or memory stress test in order to see that the function calls are taking longer or there's like a thread lock, deadlock, something like that um, could also be a way to verify um, what is going on in the background. Now, um, for metrics with open telemetry, and I tried to kind of picture it, how it, how it looks like, because the documentation is uh, in development currently. Um, the idea is really to have different types of data collection um, within um, the local kernel collector or running it in a Kubernetes cluster with different, um, what in the Kubernetes cluster, it's a watcher on events, and then it relays it um, to the, now I need to read it to the reducer. I would rather say it probably it's an ingestor, so kind of collecting the data and adding more metadata to it before actually providing it uh, to an external source. And again, um, thinking about chaos engineering, anything which comes to mind uh, from a CPU or memory stress test. Last but not least, um, someone wrote a DNS monitoring um, eBPF program or tool. Um, which is a rather long blog post which is linked here and um, breaking that could be the DNS chaos experiment with Litmus chaos. Um, and DNS is sometimes magic so I think the picture matches. Um, from a security perspective um, one of the ideas I had was maybe injecting behavioral data so that we can simulate some privilege, privilege, privilege escalation um, or try to like get access to some multi-tenancy data which I shouldn't be seeing but maybe there's a way we can like simulate that access and then the, ma the, the tools which should help prevent this could detect that and I thought well Tracy has uh, in this description it, um, it can see when a rootkit does something I was like hey there are rootkits on Linux interesting um, and it, it says, well, it's just call hooking. So when someone overrides the kill um, command or get dance, which is a directory listing. So to being able to read everything from a directory, um, even if I'm probably not allowed to. Um, and I found a recording um, and actually how to run it. And this was the first time in my life I installed a rootkit. Um, which was not a good idea because Hetzner Cloud for some reason thought that I'm attacking someone else um, and I got an abuse report yesterday so I deleted the virtual machine um, but it was really interesting to see that kind of rootkit is hiding itself so I can see that the syscalls are overwritten but I don't know who did it but I, I kind of know that the system is compromised and I thought well this could be I could take the, the good parts of the simulation towards um, maybe creating my own chaos experiments and the bad parts of the rootkit I'm not using in production. Um, but it could be, could be a way to test these things. Um, si similar to Cilium Tetragon, which also allows you to see what is being executed. And I forgot that the virtual machine was running and then I ran um, Tetragon in there and saw that the rootkit had been creating binaries, calling something and then the binary was gone. I was like, okay, this is actually also an interesting use case for simulating that. Um, another case could be like simulating uh, file access. So run, run something in a loop, for example, and try to access a file and see whether um, Tetragon is actually detecting that or it's it could also like kill the process which tries to exist. Now, um, I had this, this idea to simulate that, wasn't really sure. I um, figured that the meme is potentially the best way to describe it. Um, it could be a potential way maybe in the future. Maybe my idea is just crazy and it doesn't make sense, um, but I would love us for us to really verify that the tools we're using are actually doing their job. Um, and then I thought, well, maybe there are some other ideas I can like work, I can combine chaos engineering with eBPF. Um, and EBP, um, using chaos engineering, you often need to like intercept something or you need to break something. And I thought, hey, if we would be using eBPF probes at some point or on the kernel level to intercept traffic or to do something else, or even like <coughs> modify DNS response, this could probably help with um, many um, chaos experiments in the future which we could be creating 
and um, within Chaos Mesh there is a plugin which needs Core DNS. So if I'm not using Core DNS, I cannot really use Chaos Engineering. And I then saw that there is an experimental DNS server written in BPF. Um, I said, okay, maybe we could use that um, and inject certain responses and other things. Um, this was an idea I had last, last week. Couldn't finish, really finish it for this talk now, um, but could potentially something interesting in the future maybe coming this year. Um, and everything else, maybe it's possible to use these kind of eBPF probes to create better chaos engineering in the future. Um, or maybe I'm just crazy. Um, the other thought I had like on the other side, chaos eBPF. So there is still some work to do, especially with like, I want to ensure that the eBPF program I'm writing is not slowing down the kernel, nothing else is happening. Um, the code quality is good, and if there is not much knowledge out there how to write a good program, this might need some automated testing. Um, and code quality and security scanning in CI/CD might probably make sense. Um, and also preventing like a sub uh, supply chain attack um, in the sense of someone says, "Hey, use this nice EPPF program in, in like curl pipe bash execution mode." and then you install the rootkit for some reason or something else happens um, this would be interesting to like get the hands of early on in, in CI CD and think about DevSecOps workflows um, the problem here is, and I've linked the article um, creating some sort of mock because currently the kernel and the verifier ensures that everything is good and operational and otherwise rejects it but it's not really possible to do that without a running kernel at the moment. So it's, it really needs some work to create kind of a mock library which can then kind of simulate the kernel ver verifier. And I'm curious, I'm hoping that we can kind of solve that problem in the future. And the other thought, like well, one of the risks is if we can use eBPF to kind of control everything and get more insights those who have uh, bad intentions might also use the same technology and create rootkits and vulnerabilities and also probably things that bypass eBPF. So if you use certain programming techniques, um, you can circumvent the things uh, Cilium, Tetragon and others are currently doing with enforcement, which is an interesting cat and mouse play. Um, and this is something we need to be aware of as well so that EBPF security doesn't solve everything. Um, from like a wish list perspective, what else needs to be done or should be done? Um, an EBPF program needs to be fast and return fast again. Uh, maybe there's a way to put it into a sleep sleepable um, environment and things like that. Um, yeah, I know I had too many ideas creating this talk. Um, and sorry, you're my beta testers, it's the first time I'm giving it. Um, so let me know how, how you think about it. The, for the other wish list ideas, I really want to have a, a better developer experience, more getting started guides, a better abstraction, maybe integration in the platform, and also like have someone watch all the EBPF programs. So there are certain C functions available, but this should be much more high level to really get to see what is loaded in my kernel now. Is it, is, is it slower because of that? Um, what else is actually going on in the background. Um, so in order to create a short recap and conclusion, I think it's eBPF on its own is a great new way to collect observability data. We're getting better insights, which can help troubleshoot production and, and incidents and other things. And there are certain ideas or ways to for security observability and those enforcement. Um, using chaos engineering, I can verify the observability data and also the program behavior of eBPF programs. Maybe in the future we can integrate eBPF probes and chaos experiments. Let's see about this. We need to create some feature requests upstream for the project. Um, yeah, and probably we'll, we will be moving on with observability, correlating everything and all the things with like data ops, ML ops, AI ops, they can potentially also benefit from the more data, from the more insights we have um, 
the better or the, the less things we need to do at 3 a.m. at night because everything solves itself and then I get another job but it's a different story um, no in the end it should be easier for us and um, yeah hopefully we will also see more auto instrumentation um, so that we don't need to change the code ourselves and also get better security defaults um, for example in a Kubernetes cluster um, from the to-dos like ensuring that the program verification works in CI/CD or earlier in the stage before putting it in production and more libraries ready to use for specific use cases so that you don't don't need to become a C expert um, to actually start using them. Um, last but not least, as a, as, a, as a last learning tip, start in a virtual machine. Um, also take a step back when you don't understand, like I did some kernel technologies and I was like, yeah, that's interesting, but I have no idea what you're trying to tell me. Um, really taking notes, watching um, talks, reading blog posts, combining all the knowledge. Um, and at some point it's also important to say, well, you don't need to understand everything in eBPF for how it works, but it can help you with a general understanding of what is going on in the background, especially when someone says, hey, you need to use eBPF because everyone does. I'm like, yeah, but I, I learned that there are certain risks. Maybe we should talk about them. Um, or what else is coming in the future. That being said, thanks for attention. Um, again, here are the slides linked. I've also created an Ansible deployment project where everything I've tried is uh, ready to use. Yeah, and the, the GitLab observability direction is also linked here so you can see what we are building in the future. Thanks.